Jan de Vaver. Hallo? Hallo? Hallo. Go, go ahead, Jan, please start. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, colleagues from all over the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Jan de Faber, I'm the president of the uh, International Pediatric uh, Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council, and I wish you uh, a very uh, helpful and uh, learnful uh, experience with the webinar on, uh, on uh, myopia and uh, uh, which we will uh, present uh, in combination with the Chinese uh, Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. And with that, I will give the word to the president of the Chinese uh, a Chinese uh, Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Please go ahead. Not sure he's joined Jan, so we may need to go ahead to the... Um... Okay. Then I uh, would like to uh, introduce uh, the... Uh, the uh... Jan, I believe you're on mute. Dr. De Papa, uh, yes. please uh, may, uh, invite uh, Professor Dunway to give the introduction. And yes. then followed by the uh, in, uh, okay. introduction of the moderator. Professor Dunway, please. Okay. Yes, Dr. Zhangwei, uh, Wei Zhang, please uh, enter your uh, um, moderators of the IPOS KPOS webinar on myopia, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's my great honor to give this opening remark. Firstly, welcome to KPOS and the IPOIC joint webinar on myopia. KPOS and IPOIC planned this webinar one year ago. Now it opened today. I'd like to express my deep appreciation to all invited speakers, moderators, and uh, organizers. Without your effort and the help, we could not have this successful joint webinar. I hope all online attendees will enjoy this webinar. In addition, as the current president of People's Chinese Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, I'd like to introduce KPOS briefly. KPOS was founded in 1984, and it has about 50 standing members and have an annual national conference every year since 1984. Normally about 800 delegates attend annual national conference. In 2017, KPOS and APOS held joint conference in Shanghai, China. More than 100 international delegates attend that conference. I hope much more joint conference will be held with international organization like this, like today, but on site in the future. Finally, I wish today's strong webinar success and once again, great appreciation to all invited speakers, moderators, organizers, and our online attendees. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, and uh, with this, uh, thank you for the introduction of the uh, uh, KPOS uh, 
Uh, with this, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the moderators, Dr. Galton uh, Valconces and Dr. Che Wei uh, from uh, uh, China. Uh, uh, Chen Zhao from, uh, uh, from uh, China. You see uh, here all the credentials of the moderators. Uh, this is Professor Chen Zhao, and uh, the other is uh, Galton uh, Vasconcelos from Brazil. Uh, thank you very much for moderating this session, and good luck with uh, sharing your knowledge and moderation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh... Hello, colleagues from all over the world. It's my pleasure to moderate this uh, webinar, fantastic webinar with fantastic speakers. I will pass to my colleague, Professor Zhao. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Zhao from Shanghai Iron Yin Tea Hospital. So go ahead, Dr. Vasconcelo. The first picture, uh, first picture, Speaker is um, Professor Chen, find the critical period of myopia. Hi, Mr. President, dear colleagues, good morning and good evening. I'm Dr. Chen from Tianjin Medical University Eye Hospital. Today, I want to talk a story about we should be worried about the eye's problems, outcome from COVID-19, not from virus itself, but from the potential outcome in children that may have the major consequences for the visual acuity later in life. How to discover the critical period of children's refractive changes and formulate more perfect myopia intervention strategies by using this unexpected encounter with the epidemic situation? There's no conflict of interest and financial disclosure. Why is that necessary to find the critical period of the myopia? As we know, the critical period refers to the period in which environmental impact can play the greatest role in the process of the individual development. A large number of animal experiments have proved that both refractive system and visual central system have the window period sensitive to the specific environmental factors. Many public health experts and pediatric ophthalmologists have been working hard to find the critical period of children's refractive development at the population level and make the good use of this critical period to improve the efficiency of myopia prevention and reduce the cost of the population intervention. In the past decade, the time that children spend orders in bright lights have been identified as a protective factor for myopia. There are two important studies by Dr. He and Dr. Wu that, that among six-year children in Guangzhou, China, the additional 40 minutes of the outdoor activities at the school compared with the usual activities result in the reduced incidence of rate of the myopia over the next three years. The second from Dr. Wu said, the school-based outdoor promotion program effectively reduced the myopia changes in both non-myopic and myopic children. If we look at daytime outdoor activities as a positive effect, what will happen if the negative effect appears? Quarantine home confinements happened all over the world in the first five months of the 2020. Some countries did not allow leaving the house at all, like China. Others was not strict. A number of studies report on the lifestyle during this time, including increased screen time and the decreased outdoor play by the children during the COVID-19 regulations. Nowadays, online teaching is used more frequently than before, 
and it's become younger and younger. Based on our data, their daily online courses hours for seven to eight years old is one hour, and the time for the nine to 12 years old is two and a half hours. 13 and 15 elders kids is four hours. So, the question from there is whether home confinement may have the worst and the burdens of myopia due to decreased time spent outdoors or increased screen time at home. We use a spot for detecting ambiopia risk factors from the 2015 several areas of China in different population. The refractive values measured from spot photo screener showed a moderate agreement with a result from cycloplegic refraction. There's an overall myopic shift of the ender half diopter. For school-based screening, we believe that false negative is more harmful than false positive because false negative can lead to missing detecting of the early myopia and potentially increase the risk of the myopia progression. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, all examiners were trained to perform screening at a safe distance of the 1.8 meters from children with their arms extended to keep the screener at the 1 meter distance. All examiners and children wore the mask during the screening. We found that in the annual screenings conducted from the 2015 to 2019, the mean SER findings were the relative stable for all age groups. The SER differences between the 2020 and the previous years in children aged 9 to 13 years was smaller. However, in younger children, the story was totally different. In younger children, ICR was decreased in the 2020 compared with the previous years. For age 6, minus 0.32D. Age 7, minus 0.28D. Age 8, minus 0.29D. Also, we found that myopic shift appeared to be associated with an increase in the prevalence of myopia in children aged 6 to 8 years in 2020 compared with the previous years. The prevalence of the myopia in this age group in 2020 was 21% at 6 years, 26% at 7 years, and 37% at 8 years. These levels were significantly higher than the highest prevalence myopia in 2015 to 2019 for these age groups. Myopia progressions in age 6 to 8 years, but not in the 9 to 13 years. Even the elder children were offered more daily online learning courses. Children aged 6 to 8 may be experiencing a critical period for the myopia development. Within this age window, the plasticity of the myopia is high and the myopia control may be easier. Out of the age window, the plasticity of the myopia is low and the myopia control is harder. We published this part of our finding in JAMA Ophthalmology 2021. Nearly 90,000 readers and more than 100 media around the world have known our findings. We can look back at the JAMA Ophthalmology publications in 2021. Our research with highest views, our metric scores, news and social media attention and citations. This is the greatest recognition of our work.
So the next interesting question is, this myopia shift temporary or permanent? And is that reversible? This follow-up evaluated the refractive status and the prevalence of myopia in this population one year after the home confinement ended. Children from the same participants were screened two times in the March and September 2021. It showed that substantial increases of the ICR in the 2021 are noticed for the children aged 6 to 8 oh, yeah. compared with the previous years and is returned to pre-pandemic levels. This myopia shift was not seen in any other year's groups. Now, our funding is in review in JAMA ophthalmology. Okay, through so large scale population screening, myopic refractive changes is bi directional plastic at six to eight years old. The critical period of refractive development should be defined as a bidirectional adaptability of the visual guided eye growth in age 6 to 8 years. The critical period of the myopia will be the critical of the myopia prevention and control. The strategies for the myopia control and the intervention could be implemented on children in this age range with a possibility globe influence. We appreciate the contributions from all collaborators from the Emory University and the University of Michigan, and also our funding resources. Most importantly, thanks to every volunteer on our screening team, we cannot find the result talking about today without their efforts. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, following, uh, we're going to invite Professor Ian Morgan from Australia to talk about educational change in the in prevent onset of myopia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what I want to do today is to talk about our success in controlling the epidemic of myopia and spend a bit of time talking about changes to the school system that will help us to prevent myopia. I should note that I have a consultancy with SLR on myopia control and I've received travel support from Everising. There are two challenges. <clears throat> caused by the, epi <clears throat> the epidemic of myopia. The first is to slow the onset of myopia to lower the overall prevalence. And the second is to slow the progression of myopia to lower the prevalence of high and potentially pathological myopia. Obviously, the two go hand in hand. First of all, I'll talk about prevention of myopia progression because we've made a lot of progress in this area and there's been a lot of industry interest in development of new methodologies. <clears throat> All the keratology has been used for quite some time now to control the progression of myopia as well as correct it. Low dose atropine has been increasingly used in the last few years, but I think the really big developments have come with the uh, use of uh, contact lenses or spectacle lenses such as the MySight uh, <coughs> lenses or the Mio Smart and Stellis lenses that use imposed myopic defocus to control myopia progression. These are proving to be very successful and I think these are four te techniques that are already being applied clinically and will give us at least 50% uh, reduction in myopia progression. <coughs> there are a couple of techniques that are getting closer to clinical practice. Low intensity red light therapy, you'll hear a bit, I'm sure, about this from uh, my colleague Ming Guang He. And 
a bit further away from clinical practice yet, but defocused blue light is looking very promising as well. When we use these two te these four techniques, then we have a real potential to eliminate the epidemic of high myopia, the excess high myopia that's appeared with the epidemic of, high, of myopia. I'll illustrate this simply with some data from the Guangzhou Twin Eye study. You can see the parental <coughs> distribution of the fraction in the parental ge ge uh, generation. So it's very similar to six year old children starting school. And what happens by the end of schooling is that the refractions are smeared out over a broad band up to about uh, so minus 7.5 to maybe eight diopters. It's very simple to see that if we can reduce that by 50%, which the current techniques offer, we will ab abolish most of the excess high myopia. And of course, in order to <clears throat> achieve that end, we have to have a good system for school-based screening, and prompt referral for myopia correction and for myopia control. At the moment, screening is based on either visual acuity testing, non-cycloplegic refraction, or a LCR ratio. These are all very promising, and there's a lot of research going on on various combinations to get the least over-referral, but they will always tend to produce over-referral, and they will inevitably overestimate the prevalence of myopia. This has introduced a lot of confusion in the literature, and there are far too many papers using these inadequate techniques to characterise the prevalence of myopia. There seems to be a trend in China to introduce a new term called screening myopia to cover the fact that these techniques do not actually estimate the prevalence of myopia. They're fine for screening, they're fine for following longitudinal trends as long as you maintain consistency in the methodology, but they don't actually give you a definition of the prevalence of myopia that's useful for scientific studies. One of the big challenges in this area is the issue of premyopia, which has recently been defined as from plus 0 0.75 diopters down to minus 0 0.5 diopters. These are children obviously at risk of becoming more myopic and myopic quite soon. One of the things that hasn't yet been properly recognised is that these children are also progressing at a high rate, similar to that of the high rate seen in myopes as compared to non myopes you can see this in this data once again from the Guangzhou Twin Eye study. These are the pre-myopes. These are the myopes. You can see that the rate of change in the pre-myopes is very similar across a range of ages <clears throat> to that in myopes. This makes it really urgent to try and deal with uh, refractive change in this group as well. And this should be a very active area of research over the next few years, in particular to see if the techniques that use with myopes that we currently have will work reliably and effectively with pre-myopes. Turning now to the prevention of myopia onset, <clears throat> this depends on identifying risk factors for myopia. They have to be major factors and they have to be causal risk factors, and of course they have to be modified. There are two sorts of factors that have been identified. Excessive educational pressures, which I'll come back to in a moment, and deprivation of time outdoors. But we know that children in East Asia and Singapore, where we have clear epidemics of myopia, tend to spend much less time outdoors than children in Western countries including on weekends and during school holidays. So it's not just a school problem, but school plays a major role. We've known for <clears throat> nearly 15 years that uh, time out jaws reduces the impact near work. And it also 
reduces the impact of parental myopia. So it seems to be a very effective controlling factor. It can overcome children who spend far too much time on their work. Now this has been uh, put into practice in Taiwan since uh, 2010, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about this from uh, Professor Wu. I just want to highlight how successful this is turning to be out, turning out to be in uh, in Taiwan. Uh, these studies, the myopia investigation study in Taipei and the Yilan Myopia Prevention and Vision Improvement Program are delivering 50% reductions in the prevalence of myopia and of pre-myopia at the preschool and primary school level, measured with good cycloplegic refraction. But I want to turn to the role of schools because this has been largely neglected. Uh, although Taiwan has introduced time outdoors within schools, it hasn't tinkered too much with the overall characteristics of the school system. Kathy Rose and I, back in 2013, pointed out that there are particular characteristics of East Asian school systems that lead to high educational perform performance, but are also linked to the development of myopia. And I'll concentrate on the ones in red here. Early onset of homework and heavy homework loads from the preschool level on. Key schools and selective academic pathways that set up competition for places. And the extensive use of private tutoring schools as part of that competition. These modifying these factors in the school systems, it's likely to have a, a profound effect on the prevalence of myopia. Now, many of you will know that there have been recent uh, initiatives in mainland China to reform the education system, not driven by the need to control myopia, but to control other undesirable aspects of the load on parents and on students. This is known as a double reductions. Now, you can see that the same words crop up bans on homework, reduction on homework, ban on selective classes, reduced homework, fewer formal examinations, an effective ban on coaching or cram schools, more time outdoors for children. All of these things will help to bring down the prevalence of myopia. One of the most significant may be the move to full service schools, where schools provide care for children outside of the teaching hours. In China at the moment, this, this, the debate around this issue seems to uh, focus on using this time for supervised homework. But I'd suggest it is a great time to get children outdoors. And this is something that people concerned with preventive approaches to myopia should be pointing out. It is vital to use some of that time prevent myopia by getting kids outside more. In conclusion, we're in a good position to control the epidemic of myopia. Control of progression is now possible, but it requires prompt referral of children. In terms of prevention, increased time outdoors is working as an intervention to bring down the prevalence of myopia. And the challenge is to find sufficient time in a busy school day to uh, incorporate increased time outdoors. The recent changes to schooling in China look very promising. They need to be closely watched and their effects on both educational outcomes and myopia monitored. I'll leave you with an optimistic uh, prospect. In the last national screen in China, a Chinese school was detected with no myopia. It's a school that has three hours of outdoor games every day. And this will hopefully be the future of most schools in China. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, for your wonderful talk. It's very nice for having you uh, join this webinar. So uh, uh, we will leave all questions and comments uh, toward the end of this session. We are gonna have panel discussion at the end. So uh, our next speaker uh, would be
Dr. Yunping Li. Uh, she is associate professor and the chief of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus division uh, in the second Xiangya Hospital, Central South University in China. So she will be talking about vitamin D and myopia, a OCT study about the retinal nerve fiber layer sickness myopia with vitamin D deficiency. So Dr. Li, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm going Thank to you, speak everyone. today on the topic vitamin D and myopia, an OCT study about retinal nerve fiber layer sickness in myopia with vitamin D deficiency. I'm Yinping Li from ophthalmology department, Second Xiangya Hospital, Central South University, China. There is no commercial conflict of interest. Myopia is an important public health problem worldwide, and it's becoming increasingly prevalent globally. It can lead to virus complications, include glaucoma, retinal degeneration, retinal detachment, and macular palsy. All risk complications can increase risk of visual impairment and bloodless. Myopia is among the most common reasons for acquired bloodless in East Asian countries. Myopia is a complex disease. Both genetic and environmental risk factors are involved in. Epidemiologic evidence indicates there are three major risk factors for myopia. The first one is education. More education means more myopia, especially in Asian countries. The second one is time spent outdoors. The third one is use of computers and smartphones, which can be regarded as combined near work and deprivation of outdoors. Time spent outdoor is among the most important risk factors. Epidemiologic evidence indicates that time spent outdoors can delay the onset of myopia and is a protective factor against myopia development, but the underlying mechanism is unclear. Up to now, there are two hypotheses about the mechanism of time outdoors on myopia. One is vitamin D hypothesis. Another is light dopamine hypothesis. Since the main source of vitamin D is sunlight exposure, vitamin D is linked to myopia. Some people hypothesizing that a vitamin D pathway may mediate the protective factor of time spent outdoors on myopia. However, Studies show there is lack of genetic association between vitamin D pathway genes and myopia. Although blood 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentration is associated with increases of myopia, it seems unlikely that vitamin D has a direct protective effect on myopia progression. Vitamin D level may be acting as a biomarker for outdoor exposure. Previous study shows low 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentration may result in optic neuropathy through a decreased neuroprotective effect. Low 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentrations contribute to RFL signaling in early stage diabetic retina patients with vitamin D deficiency. Some studies also reported that vitamin D deficiency is associated with glaucoma. Individuals with myopia have an increased risk of developing open-angle glaucoma. In clinic, measurement of peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer sickness while OCT is a valuable tool for the early diagnosis of optic neuropathy and monitoring the progression of glaucoma and the extent of glaucomatous damage. When interested in the relationship between vitamin D and NFL sickness in myopia, for this, we did a small preliminary study. The purpose is to determine whether low serum 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentration was associated with RFL sickness among myopic 
teenagers. 57 healthy myopic children with vitamin D deficiency, we call VDD group 1, and 63 myopic children without vitamin D deficiency, we call group 2, were included in this study. All patients were examined by the same ophthalmologist. Mean RFL and the quadrant RFL sickness were evaluated by OCT. Vitamin D levels were measured by using a radioimmunoassay. Vitamin D deficiency was defined for 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentrations, less than 50 nm per liter, according to the definition of the World Health Organization. Ratio the clinical and the demographic characteristics of both vitamin D deficiency and the normal groups. There is no statistic difference in both groups in age, sex, intraocular pressure, excellence, spherical equivalence, except vitamin D level. This figure shows the representative example of normal and abnormal RFL sickness in the right eye of patients measured with OCT. In the normal one, we can see the global and uh, all quadrant RF sickness are normal. It shows green color. For the abnormal one, the nasal quadrant RF sickness is thinning. It shows red. We also compared the difference in global and uh, all quadrant RFL sickness. We can see the global RF sickness in group 1 is much thinner than that in group 2 for the quadrant RF sickness. The supranasal nasal and the inferior nasal RF sickness are also thinner in group 1 compared to the in group 2, especially for the nasal RF sickness. This figure includes all the statistic difference in RNF air sickness, including global and all quadrant RNF air sickness. We also confirmed that there was a significant correlation between the nasal RNF air sickness and the serum 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentrations. The correlation factor is 0.55. The difference is significant. Research evidence already shows myopic eyes are usually complicated with structural changes, such as the thinning of the peripapillary RNFL and the deformation of the optic nerve head. In our study, we found myopic children with vitamin D deficiency had a thinner RNFL than myopic children without vitamin D deficiency, particularly in the nasal quadrant RNFL. Therefore, we suggest low vitamin D may contribute to RNFL thinning in myopic children with vitamin D deficiency. We will further follow up with teenagers and see whether myopic teenagers with vitamin D deficiency have more risk to be suffered with glaucoma or glaucomatous damage. Certainly, this is a very small cohort study only recruiting 120 participants and may have resulting lack of statistical power. A well-conducted multicentric and longitudinal observation cohort study is needed. Take home message. No serum 25 hypocrisy vitamin D concentration was associated with reduced global RNFL sickness especially the nasal quadrant RFL sickness in myopic children with vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D may function as a neuroprotective component for optic nerve in myopia. The American collaborator and participate in this work thank for their efforts. Finally, thank you very much for your attention to this presentation.
a very interesting topic. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for you uh, for your interesting lecture. Uh, I guess audience will leave some questions uh, at the end. So please do stay uh, until the end of this program. We are going to have panel discussion at the end. So uh, our next speaker uh, would be Dr. Pei Chang Wu. So Dr. Pei Chang Wu is a director and associate professor of the Department of Osmology at Kaohsiung Chang'eng Memorial Hospital uh, in Taiwan. Uh, he is also the director of myopia prevention and control center. So uh, Dr. Wu will share with us a topic on the uh, outdoor and public health intervention for myopia. So Dr. Wu, please. Thanks Professor Yang and the organized committee to invite me to have this talk about outdoor and public health intervention for myopia. WHO had warned half of the global population, 5 billion people, will become myopia in 2015, and 1 billion people will be high myopia, greater than minus 5 diopter. They will have the risk of blindness. The myopic tsunami will come, and along with the consequence it brings. Therefore, not only the treatment of myopia complication, but also the importance of prevention to reduce the high myopia population. The problem is that in many countries, people still lack of awareness of these serious myopia complications. Moreover, Many people misunderstanding that laser refractive surgery could cure myopia. It is also a big barrier. Myopia is a public health problem with significantly in economic burden in the society, especially in East Asia. Awareness of its severity is a barrier. So what is the strategy to prevent myopia in public health? Professor Morgan recently published the identified major risk factors for myopia, including education and the clean school, and possibly screen time. The only and major protective factor is outdoor activities. The strategy to prevent myopia is to promote outdoor activities. Previous ROC study showed the increase 80 minutes per day outdoor time could reduce the new onset of myopia up to 50%. Professor Hearn published a study, randomized trial, named the Gold Study, showed an additional 40 minutes per day outdoor crisis could significantly decrease the myopia incidence. Our school-based clustered randomized trial encourage, encourage children to go outdoor 11 hours per week, measuring their light, light intensity in daily life. The result shows that 50%, 54% low risk of repeat myopia progression, and 30% efficacy of myopia control in myopic children. The effect could be achieved even with low to moderate light intensity, such as in hallways or under a tree.
found the result of the drug goals, drug 711 studies. It showed that compulsory policy, multi in outdoors, especially intermittent exposure to outdoors, could get the highest reduction rate in myopia incidence. In Taiwan, the 1 million primary school children data showed that encourage time outdoors 120 minutes per day reverse the increased trend of reduced visual acuity prevalence and continues to decrease. Meta-analysis study showed that more than 100 minutes, 120 minutes per day to go outdoor is the most effective intervention. And there still has a dose response relationship. In myopic children, if we could control the myopia progression up to 50%, then we can largely decrease the prevalence of high myopia population up to 90%. Nowadays, pharmacological and some optical intervention could achieve the effect up to 50%. The outdoor activity could be added on and might have the additional effect for this intervention. In conclusion, myopia is a serious public health issue. Outdoor activity two hours per day for myopia intervention is recommended. It is strongest protective factor. Moderate sunlight with an uptime is enough. It is simple, free, and effective. Not only prevent myopia onset, but also partly retard myopia progression. It is a lifelong a healthy life habit. Public health policy intervention with increased time outdoors in schools and uh, society is recommended. Thank you for your attention. Congratulations, Dr. Wu. So um, we are calling uh, Dr. Ming Wan He to talk about evidence based myopia control. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ming from Melbourne Unit. Uh, today, first of all, I would like to say thank you to uh, IPO, SC, and also the Chinese uh, Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Society invite, invited me to come over to speak in the uh, webinar organized by AAO. Today, I'm going to share with you uh, the, uh, some of the consideration of thinking on evidence-based uh, myopia control. Uh, this is conflict of interest about like a patent and also some uh, shareholding role and that uh, uh, that is uh, relevant to some of the product and solution that we're going to mention in the in the talk. So I'm going to focusing on prevalence prediction prevention and progression control. So as all we know, myopia is really uh, talking about uh, axial elongation. So uh, from the normal eye, if you develop myopia, it's got a bit like if you have an axial elongation, if it's extreme or excessive um, uh, axial elongation, you have high myopia, that will significantly increase the pathological change of the bed of the eye, the fundus. So myopia is um, control. Prevention is talking about prevent the onset of myopia. And among those developed with uh, 
established myopia, here, we wanted to slow down the, the progression. This is called control. So prevention and control is equally important for uh, myopia um, uh, treatment. So a couple of years ago, we already proved that uh, when we use the uh, uh, uniform uh, definitions, um, actually the prevalence of myopia is uh, much higher in urban Chinese children population. So for example, in the junior high graduate, 15 years old, the myopia prevalence can be 80%. And that a recent paper published in Japan, this is, can be 90%. So in comparison, uh, comparing to uh, a much lower prevalence in South Africa children, for example, 10% among the junior high graduate. So myopia has become a, a national strategy or priority for uh, uh, ch child, children, ch children health or child health. And um, there's uh, in China. So in uh, many years ago, uh, in 2006, we established a Guangzhou Twin Eye Study as a way to understand what's the contribution of genetic uh, uh, factors or and environmental factors on the development of myopia. So in this Guangzhou Twin Eye Study, we actually enrolled a large group of young twins, seven to 15 years old. And then we managed to annually examine them from 2006 all the way to 2018. So we talk about we're talking about 12 years annual visit for these twins. And then what happened, uh, as you can see from this uh, portrait, and then the, the twins, uh, actually they start when you enroll them, they're seven years old, very young, and then all the way uh, up to 12 or 10, more than 10 years, they grew up and then uh, some of them start to wear glasses. And then if you look at these twins and her core twin, actually the, they end up with different uh, cervical uh, equivalent of the optus, one is minus four and another one minus six. So they're, and equally uh, for axial elongation is similar. So they are monozygotic, they're genetically the same, but then they end up with different uh, myopia outcome. So then, but if, if you look at the uh, distribution in the monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, actually the monozygotic twins show much greater co co correlation. That's suggesting a very strong genetic effect. So when we look at the perfect, uh, the the baseline, I mean, the, the longitudinal change of the cervical equivalent among these twins, actually what we observe is that well, in uh, from time to time, and then from baseline to eight years follow up, actually the the myop the mean of the cervical equivalent uh, switch to myopic, like a myopic shift, and then uh, the variation significantly increase. And then from the heritability analysis, we kind of proved that if someone got minus ten, another one got minus zero point five. Among this variation, a lot of this variation can be actually uh, explained by uh, genetic uh, background. So, and also the twins give us opportunity to, to really observe what happened before and after the onset. So this is a paper we published a couple of years ago, and then we proved that actually before the onset, the, there's an acceleration in terms of spherical uh, equivalent changes. So they got much greater change all of a sudden. It happened like we talk about uh, from minus two to minus nine. So this is like to minus eight. So this is in one year time, this change has, has, can be as, as great as uh, uh, 0 0.8 or 0 0.7 diopters per year. So big changes before the onset of myopia. And then after that, after the onset of myopia, the, progress, the changes over time reduce. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. And then in clinical practice, uh, we understand that if some ch uh, children, seven years old, minus two diopters, and a 12 years old, minus two diopters, we understand this, uh, the younger one, uh, the early onset one got a much higher risk of developing um, high myopia in adulthood. So, but then if, if we put this into the context of like we call it percentile curve, that is more easier, like easier to understand the risk. For example, seven years old minus two, this is really below the three percentile. So this, uh, the chance of being normal is just uh, next than 3%. So this, uh, with the, this uh, percentile curve, we can easily differentiate or tell what's the risk of the, uh, for the children to be abnormal in the population in the population norm, and then similarly in the uh, twin cohort, we kind of proved that with the this long term longitudinal study data, we proved that if someone got age like onset of myopia seven or eight years old, so the chance of having myopia when they reach eighteen years old is like we talk about greater than fifty percent, but then if someone got my, myopia onset very late and thirteen years old. So the chance of having myopia in adulthood, like 18 years old, so it's all very low, 3% only. So similarly, uh, we can also predict uh, what is the 
diopters, the, me, the, the me, medium and variation of the diopters. For example, for someone with age, very on, early onset, seven or eight years old, early onset myopia. So in 18 years old, the, the mean of the or medium of the diopters would be minus six. But then for someone with very late onset of myopia, like 15 years old, then, then it will end up like only minus two. Most of them are just minus two and uh, for 18 years old. So then we also further prove that actually uh, uh, the baseline or age-specific spherical equivalence very important predictor for uh, predicting who will develop high myopia in 18 years old. And then also uh, the genetic data, like the genetic genome-wide association, like sleep data is not that helpful as long as we have the age-specific uh, age specific, uh, 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 age specific spherical equivalent data. So then uh, also in, in China, we run a, a, a long term, like about like 10 years uh, a high myopia registry study. We every one other year, we, we examine them about 900 high myopia patient. And then we prove that actually the MRI scan on the like an eye shape or ocular shape is a good predictor, very important predictor for a development of pathology changes like the future trophy or uh, even like uh, petrial trophy and, and other changes. And then we further prove that the colloidal thickness under the macula actually is a much better predictor than the spherical equivalent. So this is the best predictor is actually uh, is a sophoe uh, colloidal thickness out uh, of the, the, the ROC got a much better uh, uh, this uh, on this single uh, predictor. And then and then I'm going to there's uh, so many risk factors that being identified. Education is important. And then there's a, a, a Professor Shoshan may prove that reading, the number of reading and the intensity, the intensive of intensity of reading is important predictor. But then also parental myopia surrogate for genetic background or can be a myogenic environment. So if you got myopia parents, parents, so you got much higher risk of developing myopia. So unfortunately, we can change our genetic background. And then in a lot of social cultures, we are not able to change our reading behavior as well. So then outdoor become very important. So this is the Sydney myopia study. In Guangzhou, we proved that uh, in randomized control trial, actually every day, 40 minutes additional outdoor time is going to prevent uh, about 20% of the onset of myopia, very effective. And then we further try to translate this like an outdoor exposure light exposure to really localized or local uh, retina exposure to light as a treatment, as an alternative treatment. So this is randomized control trial on a red light therapy. And then uh, this is, again, this is home use device, just the parents, the children need to bring home and then just um, run or in, implement these treatments uh, three minutes per section, two, two sessions a day under the supervision of the parents. And then uh, we, in the, and then uh, this, light therapy actually demonstrate a very strong uh, probability or, or, or a very strong efficacy in terms of controlling axial elongation, 70% and 76% or 80% efficacy of controlling SER spherical equivalent progression. When this, uh, when the compliance is, uh, is good, like 75%, so the control on the spherical equivalent can be uh, ninety percent control on the spherical equivalent progression, and then there's not much side effect demo share. And then we also see colloidal thickening, and then uh, also interestingly, we observe a uh, significant axial shortening. Like the actually, we, so we, we talk about reverse uh, um, um, of myopia at certain uh, degree, and then the possible mechanism may be uh, associated with scleral hypopsia. And then the take home message is myopia should consider both onset and progression. Predictions uh, enable us to identify who need more aggressive treatment. And then outdoor is effective for prevention. And then uh, there's um, uh, optical pharmaceutical treatments for uh, myopia control. And then uh, this repeated uh, red light therapy can be uh, an alternative. Thank you so much. Very nice talk and very nice papers. Thank you very much, Dr. Hu, for your wonderful lecture. So again, we are going to discuss at the end of this session. Uh, so our last speaker of this uh, webinar uh, would be Dr. Jason Yam. So Dr. Yam uh, is the head of pediatric, uh, pediatric ophthalmology and yes, surgery it's my great pleasure. in Hong Kong Eye Hospital. And more important, he's currently uh, the secretary general of Asia Pacific 
astrophysicism, astrophysicism and pediatric ophthalmology society. So uh, Dr. Yan will be talking about low concentration atropine drops for myopia control. So please go ahead, Dr. Yan. Uh, Jason Yan is the brilliant mind behind the training and education committee. So many of these wonderful webinars are uh, under his supervision. And so I want to thank you as well. Yeah. Pleasure to present to you today the low concentration atropine drug for myopia control. I have no financial interest to disclose. Two very important uh, atom study, the Singapore atom study is very important in establishing the use of the atropine for myopia control, in particular the atom 2 study, 0.5%, 0.1%, and 0.01%. It bring the interest of using low concentration atropine uh, for myopia control to the world. However, after the APTOM study, there are still remaining some important questions to be answered. Are there any efficacy compared to the placebo group? Are there any concentration-dependent response? What are the optimal concentration? Are the long-term efficacy better, especially during the second year or third year? Are there any effect on the corneal and lens power? Are there factors associated with the treatment response? Any biomarker? Should we continue the treatment after two years? And any rebound effect? And any longer-term efficacy for intervening? And so today I would like to share with you some of the results from our LAMP study, which we started in 2016. And uh, we recruited 438 children, 4 to 12 years of age, in 0.05%, 0.025%, 0.01%, and placebo group. And uh, up to now, we reported three year results. And uh, so we follow up every four months. And uh, here we have reports about six uh, reports, and today, yeah, I will share with you the data and also I would like to thank uh, for our uh, the funding support from the Hong Kong government and the government of mainland China. In the first year, we in particular compared with the placebo group and we confirmed there is a concentration dependent response. There is a 0.05%, 0.025%, 0.01% in the placebo group in the SE changes and in the SE link elongation. Comparing to the placebo group, 0.05% can achieve about 67% reduction in the myopia progression. 0.01% is about 27% reduction. And of course, the change in the pupil size accommodation loss are also follow concentration dependent reform. In 0.05%, there is about one millimeter increase in the pupil, whereas in the 0.01% is about 0.5 millimeter increase. And uh, uh, the accommodation loss for the 0.05% is about two diopter, whereas in the 0.01% is about 0.3 diopter long. And the vision VA for distance and near are all similar. The use of the photochromic glasses, progressive glasses, photophobia at the first year are all similar across all the treatment groups. And also the VFQ are that uh, score are also similar uh, in all the four groups after the first years. So the first year result demonstrate that is a uh, uh, low concentration atrophy is effective compared to the placebo group and also there is a concentration dependent response. All concentrations are well tolerated and 0.05% is an optimal concentration during the first year of time. And in the second year, we follow up the treatment in the, in the second year, uh, but in the placebo group, we switch over to the 0.05% because of the ethical reason. And we found that the, the concentration dependent response remained in all the three groups, 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0.01%. Here, the switch over group then, you can see there is a, a better result after switching over from the, uh, using the placebo. And uh, we found that 0.05%, the efficacy is almost double, that of 0.01% over two years' time. And the efficacy during the second years are clinically similar to that of first year, in particular, the 0.05%, 0.025%. And uh, so um, uh, the, the summary of the second year results also uh, co continue that uh, the uh, concentration dependent response are uh, continued and maintained over a longer period of time. All concentration are well tolerated and 0.05% observed, efficacy observed was double that of 0.01%. Uh, we also noticed, as in also in other study, that the efficacy in the SE progression seems to be better than the SE elongation in using the low concentration atrophine jobs. And um, 
uh, P, uh, some researcher has postulated whether this unexpected distinction is due to the effect of the low quantum entropy on the corneal curvature and corneal power. This is effective. This is a very important question because the end, when the anti myopia effect is mediated via SU elongation or other associated biometric changes is important. And uh, so we look into the other biometric parameter during this ocular biometric study. Uh, we included also the corneal power, lens power, and pre chamber depth. However, we found that only the SU, uh, SU elongation and the SC change follow the concentration dependent response, but the corneal power, lens power, and pre chamber depth are similar. And uh, in fact, the uh, SU elongation alone contributed to about 75 to 80% of the SC change in the variance. The remaining are contributed by the lens power and corneal power, but the contribution among all the group are similar. And therefore, uh, in this ocular biometric study, we found that the anti-myopia effect of the HOP in fact are reducing via SU elongation, and therefore it can reduce the risk of future myopia complication. Another question we want to ask is what are the associated factor for the treatment response in the low quantum HOP? And we do a secondary analysis. And we found that among all the baseline factors, in fact, age is the single and most important factor determining the treatment response. Here you can see that the older the age, the better the treatment response, the younger the age, the poorer the treatment response in all the treatment group. The poorer response in the younger age is because of the inherent uh, faster progression. And uh, using uh, at the age of 4, using 0.05%, in fact, the result is similar to the age of 6, using 0.025%, similar to the age of 8, using 0.1%. And uh, so the factor associated with the treatment response, uh, age there is in addition to the concentration dependent response, in fact, there is also an age dependent effect. The younger children has a poorer, uh, a poor, poorer treatment response and require a higher concentration to achieve a similar efficacy as in older children. Therefore, a higher concentration should be administered, especially in those high-risk children, young children, uh, for better progression, better prevention. And uh, um, in addition to the age-dependent effect, are there any biomarker for the treatment response? In fact, we, and, and then we do an OCT study and we notice a choroid, there is a choroidal thickening in the concentration in the low concentration HOP also follow a concentration dependent response. This is 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0.01%, uh, and also the uh, placebo group to the bridge over. And uh, the the choroidal uh, uh, the choroidal change is also correlated to the SE progression over two years time. And in fact, the contribution of the choroidal thickening is contributing to the change in the SE progression. And in fact, the indirect effect is about 20%. And therefore, the low concentration HOP can induce a choroidal thickening effect along a concentration dependent effect. And the choroidal thickening is associated with a, a slower SE progression and SE elongation. Choroidal response could be potentially used as an assessment for the long-term treatment outcome and as a guide for concentration titration for HOP. In our latest report, this is a third year report, we want to ask a question whether we should continue the treatment or we can stop the treatment over two, after two years. And uh, we also look into the rebound phenomenon. In this time, in the third year, we uh, do a re-randomization. Uh, uh, in each group, we do a continued treatment and in other group, we do a washout wash out treatment. And here we can see, uh, in fact, after in each group, continued treatment leads to a better efficacy compared to uh, stopping treatment. And uh, also, uh, um, in the washout group, in the rebound phenomenon, we noticed there's two important factors, the age and also the treatment concentration. The older the age, the less the uh, rebound, and the higher concentration, the more rebound. Also, Look, there is a concentration dependent effect, but in 0.05% to 0.01%, the washout over one year's time are clinically not very significant. And uh, so over in the, our third year time, uh, we, we uh, suggested that during the third year, treatment should be continued uh, because it can achieve a better efficacy. And 
0.05% over three years time remain the optimal concentration and stopping treatment at an older age and lower concentration is associated with a smaller rebound. The differences in rebound was clinically small among all these three groups and uh, we suggest 0.05% could be continued uh, in the third year during uh, for the Asian children. This is a summary of uh, our result of the LAMP study. And I would like to stop here and thank my uh, department and my team, uh, especially uh, Professor uh, Kevin Peng, Professor Kevin Tan for all the support and guidance, and Professor Chen Lei Gai, Dr. Gam Gawai, and Ms. Mandy uh, for their co work. And we work together on uh, the LAMP study, Hong Kong Children Study, and Hong Kong Children Eye Genetic Study. So thank you very much for all your attention. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, wonderful uh, talk. Um, Dr. Zhao, any remark? Yeah, very, very nice talk. Uh, very informative uh, and very solid evidence. So thank you very much, Dr. Yan. Uh, I believe all speakers have finished uh, their talks and some audience have raised some questions and some of the questions have been answered in the Q&A box and I think uh, we should move to our panel uh, discussion. So any uh, questions or comments will be welcome. I have a comment based on the questions and questions people post. Uh, people are very interested in sunlight exposure, how to prescribe it, how to advise it. Uh, with or without sunglasses, uh, those glasses should have blue light control. Uh, what what is uh, the panel opinion? Dr. Chen, Morgan, Pate, uh, Wu, Wu, Li, He. Any suggestion to the the the, the audience concerning how? to exposure to light, not to sun. Is that what I get, got from, from it? Yeah, I think Dr. Morgan ha has uh, answered this question. So Dr. Morgan, do you have any uh, opinion on this regard? Well, look, Australia is a country that has lots of problems with uh, sun exposure. We have the title of the melanoma cap capital of the world. So we're well experienced with this. The crucial observation is that it is visible light and not vitamin D. That seems to exert the protective effect. And that means that <clears throat> the, the effect uh, that myopia prevention is fully compatible with skin protection from sunlight. Had it been the other way around, it would have been more of a problem. Whether children need sunglasses outdoors, we certainly don't make that uh, mandatory in Australia. Uh, maybe we should, but good sunglasses will let through <clears throat> visible light, but cut out vitamin D. So I think good sunglasses, you can get cheap ones that are much worse, but good ones should be once again, fully compatible with prevention. Uh, Dr. Wu, any comment on that? Yeah, in uh, in our study, we had showed that uh, uh, not uh, we don't need to expose you to the very strong sunlight because uh, the the light intensity is over uh, one hundred thousand lux. So, but uh, in our study, showed that just only in the hallways or in the under the tree, uh, we can uh, with uh, enough time, then we can get the uh, effect, especially for the myopia prevention and for the myopia control. So I would also suggest that if children go under the very strong sunlight, uh, they did not have to have the head, uh, or maybe you can use the sunglasses. Even though uh, if, uh, just behind the sunglasses, uh, it's, uh, it's around uh, 6,000 uh, last exposure. So uh, Professor uh, 
some may so had a, uh, made, uh, done a study showing that it's also effective for the uh, outdoor exposure. Thank you. Okay, uh, good. Uh, so uh, I, I have a question uh, for Dr. Ming Guang He. Hey, Dr. He. Hey, Dr. Hi. Yeah, yes. so uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so uh, your right leg therapy, uh, in your talk, you say you say that your right leg therapy is, uh, it sounds very interesting. So uh, do you think that it can be combined with any other kind of treatment such as atropine or also K? Can it be combined? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Uh, so actually, in 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 in, in Zongzhan Orphan Center, we are running a clinical trial. We're looking at the at the children who did not respond to ortho K, and then we ran, randomized them to continue ortho K, and then also uh, another group is to just add the um, red light treatment. So actually, uh, we observed there's a really strong synergic effect when you combine ortho K and red lights. But then, but then in general, we don't recommend a combination of uh, low, even low dose auto pain and red light because with the uh, low dose auto pain it will change the it may not dilate the pupil but then it will change the light response uh, the, the pupil response to light so sometimes if the pupil is too big then then we are a little bit worried about overdose issues so in, in short uh, a combination of uh, auto k and uh, red light will, will see a very strong synergy effect but then we don't recommend a combination uh, with red light with the uh, even low dose atopine. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Dr. Jason, uh, what about combination? People are asking about combination of treatments, especially when you have this uh, second year, third year, would you recommend, is there any clinical um, um, data concerning that combination of treatments would uh, make the response better uh, in between the second and, and, and the third year. And another question um, that pan, the, 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 um, happened was um, people are very, uh, um, very, uh, people are under four years old with a minus to myopia or um, a myopia that they, this child can cope well. Should we think of um, prescribing atropine or wait and observe it? Thank you, Gautin, uh, for the questions. Uh, I think uh, with now more tools that we have for myopia control, combination therapy should be the way moving forward. And in view of uh, to hope to have a more powerful uh, effect on the control. And the myopia control uh, is age dependent. The younger the age, the more difficult or the faster the progression uh, for the progression. And therefore we need to be more aggressive in terms of the myopia progression. Uh, a child with a myopia onset at the age of, as already pointed out by Professor uh, Ming Guang He, the very wonderful study. If you have an age at four to have myopia onset compared to a child with an age at 12, myopia onset is totally different scenario. So uh, so if a child having a myopia onset early, we need the progression is very, very fast. And therefore I think uh, combination therapy is the way to move forward. So far the data is not many, but at least uh, uh, combination with low concentration HOP with off OK show that uh, demonstrate a better effect as recently published in the BJO uh, by a group in uh, uh, China, Guangzhou, Dongfan. Uh, so this is uh, one of the way that to move forward. And also, especially now with uh, Professor Hong Ming Guang's uh, uh, initiative on the red light therapy, which is very wonderful work. And, and with moving forward, I think there are many rooms for us to help pe uh, the child to improve their advocacy. Professor Hu, uh, uh, you've mentioned uh, ortho K and atropine. Uh, would you recommend on any other combination of treatments? Uh, atropine? Um, of course, uh, atropine with the optical methods such as uh, defocus glasses, uh, these are also very uh, commonly used in Hong Kong, but uh, I do not aware a lot of very uh, uh, solid data to demonstrate a clear 
uh, combination effect yet. I believe uh, many data is ongoing and we are wait until more data to be shown. But before the data is shown, at least in clinical practice, I would suggest to have combination therapy for those fast progressor uh, 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 as for to help these people, help these children and families. Would you mean faster progression, younger children or younger not? Younger children, high parental myopia, uh, uh, fast progression in the previous one year. And I, this is a very important question. I think uh, Professor Ho, uh, uh, Professor Morgan and Professor Wu will have uh, some insight to share with us too. Yeah, so in, yeah, so in Australia, actually uh, when we are seeing the very highly progressive uh, children, like for example, uh, one year greater than one doctors per year. So, and uh, I've, I feel that uh, because I, I'm a very traditional guy, uh, and then I'm very open in, in our understanding, we will try a uh, high dose atropine, actually, actually 1%. 1% atropine twice a week. And then we also prescribe a uh, photochromatic lens and also a uh, PAL so that we can control this, uh, the, the, the side effect of the high dose atropine. And then we can see immediate control effect. But then they, later on, when the myopia uh, uh, progression is reduced, and then we reduce the dose and convert to a lower do uh, concentration as well. So uh, we try uh, actually uh, asking a parents to try to a uh, combine combination of therapy and it's quite uh, challenging because you ask them put an auto okay and also a uh, 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 eye jobs and then uh, it's quite uh, uh, quite challenging. I mean the, the for for in particular in in our culture in, in so in Australia very hard to convince parents like that to to, to do that. Thank you, Doctor Her. There is a question uh, of uh, Dr. John Sloper, president of uh, ESA. The study of the sensitive period for my myopia development used non-cycloplegic refraction. Is there any evidence for actual lens changes, changes in those children, or could all this be explained by changes in accommodative tone secondary to bumping, to be being uh, confined indoors? Uh, any comments on that? Psychoplegic, non psychoplegic uh, during the studies? So we're trying to answer your question <laughs> with more time. Any other comments? Yeah, we do some research as, uh, about the uh, cycloplegic and the uh, non cycloplegic refraction during the large scale population screening. We found that for the younger children, if you use a non cycloplegic photo screener, for myopia, it's a pretty similar uh, as a uh, cycloplegic. But for the uh, hyperopia, there may be ender, ender. And uh, so, this is why we want to use a, a photo screener to the, do the population scale, the myopia screening. Pretty same. We, we, we do some of the research, compare the cycloplegic and non-cycloplegic uh, uh, before and after cycloplegic. It's my comment. Thank you, Chairman. Uh if we have more time, uh, there's someone who asked about uh, educational changes and developing uh, guidelines to all schools regarding the screen time. Is that possible? Dr. Morgan mentioned that the sunlight in Australia, for example, or in Brazil, we have a lot of sunlight. Is, is it possible to develop those guidelines? Should uh, are they uh, effective, uh, or we should should we make uh, changes concerning uh, uh, urban, rural, the, the, uh, change uh, change uh, countries, and so on. Doctor Morgan. Okay, look, I'll say something on that. At the moment, I don't think there's any really convincing evidence that screen time is the crucial factor, and one simple reason for questioning its role is that we had an epidemic of myopia in East Asia before we had screens. Yeah, this was appearing back in the uh, 70s. It was well established in Hong Kong by that stage when even just 
things as simple as personal computers were not in common use. You know, screens are a really recent phenomenon. So you can get an epidemic of myopia without screens. Uh, whether we need guidelines, therefore, to control screen use uh, is, uh, I think, at the moment, an, an, an open question. Uh, education authorities love controlling screens because it means they don't have to do something about the education system and get kids outdoors more. So. Uh, I think what we do need at the moment are very clear guidelines about amounts of time outdoors and in what circumstances, how much, uh, what sort of light level, as uh, Professor Wu's work has uh, raised, what sort of light level do we need to get a practical preventive effect when you're getting children outdoors? I think. Guidelines there are much more important at this stage than limits on screen time, except, of course, in the sense that screen time stops children from going outdoors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, may, I also, may I also ask uh, Professor Morgan to comment on the uh, psychoplegic uh, use uh, for the refreshing in terms of myopia? <laughs> it's a big question, but basically, uh, when people are basing their results on uh, large scale screening, then large, it's very difficult to systematically use cycloplegia in large scale screening. But there are issues when you uh, measure uh, without uh, cycloplegia, and in particular, you have the phenomenon of uh, pseudo pseudomyopia. And I have the same sort of question about the uh, the, the the study of the effect of uh, of uh, of the COVID quarantine. Is this a uh, response that's largely mediated by uh, excessive accommodation? which can then relax once children are out of uh, quarantine. I think, and, and this is a remark I'll address most of all to uh, our Chinese colleagues, I think you can get a certain amount of information from building on large-scale screening, but I think there's also a very strong case for doing smaller, very dedicated studies where you use solid cycloplegia because that avoids any ambiguity in the answers. You mean, you, uh, Dr. Morgan, you mean, when you mean cycloplegic, there is a question on that. Would you mean tropicamide and cyclopentolate or both combined? Or uh, what, what would you suggest for a uh, following study? Well, I think yeah, there's a, a lot of experience with this in uh, some pretty large studies in, in China. And I think the important thing, it, when you're doing a scientific study, we're not talking about public health ex exercises here. When you're doing a scientific study, you need to assess how effective the cycloplegia has been. Uh, and the uh, pretty standard protocol certainly used in Gu the Guangzhou studies is to look for pupil dilation and the absence of a light reflex. And if children do not meet that criterion, then you simply do not include those results because they are likely to be contaminated by inadequate cycloplegia. Whether then you have to be pragmatic. We know that um, uh, children with very light eye color, colors are much easier to cycloplege. Um, uh, where there are much darker eye colors, um, you, you need to uh, push it harder. But the bottom line is always assess how effective the cycloplegia is. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, okay, uh, I think there are still many questions 
not be answered in the Q&A in the box, but uh, we just got alert that we have to wrap up in five minutes. Uh, so uh, I think there's still one uh, interesting question in Q&A uh, from Louisa. So uh, this question is, uh, does average color influence the decision for choosing HOP concentration? So anyone have any idea on this? I think this is probably the last uh, uh, the, the last uh, questions we can answer. Does Aries color influence the decision for choosing HOP in concentration? I think Augusto in UK, United Kingdom, they're running a study. They're trying to understand what's the uh, effect uh, of the low dose HOP on European uh, children. They're running the study. Uh, they, I think they, they, the data is pretty much ready and then they should be able to publish it very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sati, um, I'm Jason, and then final remark. Uh, yes, uh, thank you to all. Um, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I want to uh, present the next webinar that will be uh, held by IPOS with Argentina's Association of uh, Pediatric Ophthalmologists and Strabismus. Uh, it will held on 29 of uh, 27 on November, and its topic will be restrictive strabismus. Um, we will send uh, then the topic and the moderators, but the topic will be very interesting because it's um, uh, bring out very much questions uh, to our colleagues. So uh, please kindly um, uh, stay tuned about our uh, next uh, webinars and I uh, can I ask to all panelists stay uh, kindly for making a, a picture for all sure Jason do you do or me yes please uh, may I invite all our panel to uh, switch on the uh, camera uh, Dr. Dipaba, uh, Dr. Sonel, Dr. Li Yuping, uh, uh, Giovanni and also Dang and uh, and Michael, if uh, it's also here, please uh, uh, let us uh, switch on the camera and then we, this is a very good uh, timing to take a good picture in this webinar. So uh, I will do one and Sati also please uh, uh, help me to do one, uh, maybe. So uh, Dr. Dipawa or Dr. Sonel, uh, if available, please uh, switch on the camera. Okay, so, um, Maybe uh, we take one picture first. Okay, uh, let's look at the camera. One, two, three. Oh, uh, Dr. Dipaba is here. Now we, we take one more. Yeah, and, here uh, I am, sorry. <laughs> okay, no worry. Uh, let's do one more picture. Let's, uh, one, two, three. Sati, would you mind to do one more picture? Yes, sure. Uh, one, two, three. 